more weeks. <laughs> And my role, uh, my job here at Tulane is uh, to be the law school's director of communications. And that role, I tell the story of how Tulaneans are changing the world. Most evenings for the past two years as my role in, as an MPA student, I have seen the hard work and commitment of my peers as we learn to be better public servants and to bring positive, lasting, and equitable change to our communities. I am humbled in both my job and in my studies to be a witness to so much hope for the future, all right here at Tulane. In addition to my MPA studies, I stand here today as president of the first in Louisiana student chapter of the International City County Management Association. The Tulane ICMA is a small organization, but in just a few months has expanded opportunities for Tulane students who want to build a career in public service. We are already making strides to connect the next generation of public servants and advocates with those who are currently working in the field. What I see at Tulane in the MPA program, at the law school, and at the Tulane ICMA are students who care deeply about their communities, who are innovators and leaders. They wanna find solutions and celebrate our differences because they are our strengths. Today, I am immensely proud to be part of this celebration of one of the great American heroes of our lifetime. A man who, like my peers, had the commitment to justice and a desire to change the world. The Tulane MPA program is helping us be more like Congressman Lewis, to be brave, to think beyond today, to never ever give up, and to make some noise and get into good trouble. We are ready to take up his standards. And now I would like to introduce you to the director of the John Lewis Public Administration Program who has been a steadfast mentor, educator, and friend to me and scores of other students in this program, Dr. Halima Leek Francis. This is a moment. Um, I see so many friends, colleagues, family members, um, and I just want you all to know how deeply I appreciate you all. Um, before we get started, thank you, Alina, for that wonderful welcome and introduction. Um, as she shared, I am Dr. Halima Malik Francis, the director of the, of the um, John Lewis Public Administration Program. <laughs> Clearly, I have to practice that more. And I'm proud to offer my most heartfelt welcome and greetings. Before we start today, um, we have much to celebrate. And as we open this very special event, I'd like to begin our time together by acknowledging and paying tribute to the original inhabitants of this land. The city of New Orleans is a continuation of an indigenous trade hub on the Mississippi River known for thousands of years as Bobancha. Native people have lived on this land since time immemorial, and the resilient voices of Native Americans remain as inseparable part of our local culture. With gratitude and honor, we acknowledge the indigenous nations that have lived and continue to thrive here. Thank you. As I shared, this celebration is deeply meaningful to me. So much so that members of my family are here virtually and in person. There are people on the live stream and, and my parents have come in from North Carolina uh, to join us for this moment. My husband, my bonus son, Steven is here. And I see scores of other family members and friends who've traveled to be here today. But today, as we honor the late US Representative John Lewis, 
his dedication, his hope, his sacrifice, and his service, I believe we're called to reflect on our histories as we build our futures. Recognizing Congressman Lewis's enduring impact on our lives, our freedoms and our communities, it's a true honor to be able to name our public administration program for him and to carry on his legacy in this way. This naming is significant in so, so many ways, and it serves as a reminder that we stand on the shoulders of Congressman Lewis and so many others who gave their lives to uphold justice, equity, and democracy. Given our commitment as a program to preparing forward-thinking, responsive, and ethical public service professionals to effectively lead within a diverse and ever-changing civic sector, what better a place to honor and acknowledge Congressman John Lewis than right here and right now in this moment? Here at Tulane, where in, in May of 2019, the university recognized Congressman Lewis's work as an activist, a civil rights and political party leader or po political leader by awarding him with an honorary doctorate of humane letters. At the School of Professional Advancement, where we provide distinctive high quality educational opportunities that fit into the lives of working adults and diverse student population. Where Suri Deitch in 2016 became the first woman to be named as the school's dean in the 100 plus year history of the school, setting in motion her vision to extend the school's societal impact through a public administration program. And I later joined in 2019 as the school's first African American program director to lead the program's creation, the curriculum design and launch. And today we have our students who are proudly stand in the, the John Lewis Public Administration Program. And I'd like to welcome our students for a moment to stand if they will. This is just a snapshot of the wonderful faces that we get to see in our program as it's online. About 50% of our students are here in the area and the rest span across the nation. Our students are doing important work. They're building important school skills. They are growing knowledge so that they can become public administrators, elected and appointed officials, nonprofit and philanthropic professionals, corporate leaders who are community responsive, results driven and impact focused. Indeed, this is a fitting tribute to Congressman Lewis's legacy and a worthy North Star as we chart our path forward to realizing the beloved community. My deepest gratitude to all who have joined, joined us here and all who've been a part of this journey as we're sharing this moment. So now I'd like to introduce our Dean, Suri Deitch. Not only has Suri had a tremendous impact on our public administration program, as you heard. But under her leadership, the School of Professional Advancement is taking a fresh look at how it and Tulane can best meet the needs of, of working adults and employers throughout the New Orleans area and beyond. Her commitment to increasing access to life transforming benefits of knowledge and skill shows in her visionary leadership of SOPA. And I deeply appreciate her as a colleague and a friend. Suri, thank you for all you do. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, so you know you're in an organization with a good work culture when you can call upon a faculty member to take over tech when a staff person gets ill, um, or uh, or me. I I actually answered a phone call while you were talking. Sorry, but it was to get someone up here. Um, so we're pretty informal. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, this evening is the annual Kol Nidre service in Judaism, which is a time in which we examine and reflect upon our vows, commitments, and responsibilities to ourselves and to one another. And I think it is a fitting day on which to consider the life and legacy of Congressman Lewis, a, a paragon of commitment and responsibility to others. 
when I came to Tulane in 2016, it seemed to me that there was an opportunity for the university among the many challenges facing New Orleans and the Gulf Coast region was the lack of sufficient numbers of individuals with the knowledge and experience required to successfully lead our civic sector institutions forward during an era of great need on many fronts. The opportunity for us at Tulane in building the program from the ground up was that we could be directly responsive to what we heard from current civic leaders about their troubles and challenges. We could shape a program around the requirements of our racially and otherwise diverse, largely working adult student body, but also build a curriculum and an academic experience that centered equity. Having launched the program two years ago, we already have so much to show for our efforts. Many members of our community of students, faculty, and alumni are here today in person or watching online from around the United States. And I just wanna give a quick shout out to Mia Blom, who's called in from Baltimore. Mia, there's a really big picture of you at the front of the room that you can't see. Um, I'm so grateful to my dear friend and colleague, Kalima Leek Francis, who has led the creation of this excellent public administration program, and to all of you who have been a part of building and supporting it. Our students, faculty, and alumni are truly moving our society forward toward the beloved community described by Congressman Lewis. It is a joy and an honor, therefore, to have the permission of his family to name the program after him, and in so doing, have this powerful way of acknowledging your work. Eric Holder's book, Our Unfinished March, eloquently makes the argument that there is no progress toward greater social equity in the US without considerable effort, and that gains can be reversed. How encouraging then to be here today, surrounded by so many people who are having an impact. Among those who have been personally touched by John Lewis is our next speaker, who had the honor of meeting him a number of times throughout his career. Since joining Tulane in 2014, as the university's 15th president, Mike Fitz has created and supported programs like today's, which celebrate those who shaped culture and our community's efforts to become more equitable, diverse, and inclusive. He established the Tulane Trailblazers program, which we continue today, along with a host of different retrospective and forward-thinking initiatives around this critically important work. I'm so pleased to introduce him to speak about the Trailblazers program and hopefully to give us some reflections on the life and legacy of our new namesake. Please join me in welcoming President Mike Fitz. Mm. Thank, thank you, Dean Deitch, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for your remarks and uh, your support and good work as Dean, dean of the school. Um, so welcome, welcome to everybody. Uh, welcome to those joining us in the, the ball gallery with the best view in the entire university. Um, and for those of you online and wishing you were here, um, welcome as well. Um, again, the best view in the university. Um, as Dean Deitch said, this, this event has been uh, more than three years in the making. I say that because in April, 2019, we established the Tulane Trailblazer Initiative to recognize and celebrate Tulaneans from diverse backgrounds, those who are truly leading the way to the university, becoming a more equitable, diverse and inclusive family. Um, our Trailblazers span decades, schools, programs and centers and each of our honorees have played a critically important role in shaping Tulane University. The man we honor today, the late iconic US Representative John Lewis, is the definition of a trailblazer. His life and career continue to have a lasting impact on the students, faculty, and staff at Tulane. But of course, John Lewis had influenced its stretch far beyond our campuses. He led a life of service in support of justice, forever etched in the civil rights movement for organizing, marching, and speaking up against racial and economic injustice at every turn. Lewis is perhaps most famous for his role in the 1965 Voting Rights March across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. But his March for Hope and Change continued throughout his life serving an incredible 34 years as U.S. Representative from Georgia. I had the honor of meeting John Lewis numerous times. 
He was a friend, colleague, and confidant to two of my most important mentors, Judge Leon Hiccup-Otham, for whom I clerked and assisted in his writing his book, In the Matter of Color, and Lou Pollock, the iconic federal judge, civil rights advocate, and former dean of the Yale and University of Pennsylvania Law Schools, who was a co-author of the brief in Brown versus Board of Education. But that was ancient history, not for me, but likely for our students. Fast forward to 2019 and Tulane University. I wrote Congressman Lewis a letter requesting his presence at our unified commencement ceremony to honor him with an honorary doctor of human letters. We knew how much the Congress meant to our entire community and to our light, he accepted. There was a buzz on campus, a buzz that turned into an absolute roar by the time he, uh, we arrived at the Superdome for our ceremony. Keep in mind, 2019 was a star-studded year, even for a Tulane commencement ceremony. Our honorees included a Pulitzer Prize recipient, a Tony and M, M award-winning actor, and the CEO of one of the largest, most recognized companies in the world. But there was a hush over the bustling room when John Lewis arrived. He was like a magnet walking through the crowd. To a person, each of our honorary degree recipients and truly every single person I spoke to considered it an honor to be in Lewis's presence. But I have to confess, I quietly wondered at the time, would our students, how would they react? That iconic moment in Selva, Alabama was almost 40 years before our graduates had been born. But as we announced his name on stage, literally 20,000 people, graduates, their loved ones, and our platform party rose in a standing ovation, giving him the honor that he truly received in their love and affection and admiration for him. It was one of hundreds of iconic moments in John Lewis's life and career, but it was a moment that will be forever remembered by Tulaneans in attendance. It really showed that not only did he have an effect on our history, but that was passed on to the generations after him, which is why the naming of this uh, program is so important in his legacy. This ceremony is an incredible fitting way to dedicate our program. We have a wonderful lineup of people who share our love and respect for the late Congressman. This after program, program includes Linda Early Chaz Tang, president and CEO of the uh, John and Lillian uh, Miles Lewis Foundation, and our keynote speaker, of course, Eric Holder, former Tulane parent, most important part, Tulane parent, <laughs> author, and by the way, the 82nd Attorney General of the United States. <laughs> the first African-American to hold uh, that position. Um, the, the difficulty, who do I turn the podium over at this point? <laughs> okay. I turn it back, okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, President Fitz. So today we are grateful for those who are here with us in person, especially those who are local uh, state and federal officials. If you are a local public official, please stand so we can recognize you. And we are also grateful to those who are with us um, in a virtual format. Um, there's a few folks we would like to uh, mention. Uh, Lynetta Gilbert, who is a member of the board of our MPA program. Sitting next to her is Miss Jessie Smallwood, who I had the pleasure of meeting today, who is a local civil rights leader and who has some amazing advice. So. I, I would spend time with her. <laughs> uh, Cheryl Landrew, who is the uh, chair of the New Orleans Book Festival at Tulane. Hi. <laughs> and I don't think I saw him here, but Tim Francis, who is, hi, Tim. <laughs> I didn't see you, sorry. Tim is a beloved Tulane Law alum, and he is also a trustee here at Tulane. So thank you for being with us. Now, I would like to uh, turn this over to Dr. Lee Francis, who will introduce our next speaker. Oh, 
So while we're preparing uh, remarks from our next speaker, um, I wanna share some background with you. So we had an opportunity to speak to a lot of people or with a lot of people on the road to naming our program for Congressman Lewis. His family, his friends, uh, mentees, staff, colleagues, uh, people who crossed his path in, in all areas of his work, all people he, he inspired. In these conversations, I consistently heard that when you talk to John Lewis, you felt as if you were the only person there. This isn't a new observation. However, for me, it stands out because it's what I would interpret as his ability to see people. He saw people in everything he did. Effectively, he saw humanity and that guided his work. This love for humanity has continued in many, many ways through the John and Lillian Miles Lewis Foundation, whose mission is to strengthen democracy through civic engagement, guided by truth, integrity, and moral clarity, with a goal of amplifying voices of rising generations. Sharing a special message from the John and Lillian Miles Lewis Foundation, we will hear from Linda Chastain, a founding member of their board of directors and also the foundation CEO. The two-lane trailblazer. Congressman John Lewis made an indelible, incredible, and lasting impact on our nation as a whole and on the communities in which we live. He made it possible for millions to vote. He changed the landscape of our democracy. He improved the lives of everyday citizens. He set an example for all of us. He taught us how to live. He taught us how to love. He taught us how to forgive. He showed us courage, not just on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, but in standing up for what is right all of the time. I worked for, knew, and loved John Lewis for more than 40 years. Today, I serve as president and CEO of the foundation that he created. John Lewis taught me some very important lessons. I know he would want me to share them with you today. Decide what are your core values, he would say. Never deviate from them and always have them top of mind. Let them be your guide in all that you do. Indeed, of the civil rights movement, believe it or not, John said it was love at its best. It is one of the highest forms of love that you beat me, you arrest me, you take me to jail, you almost kill me. But in spite of that, I'm going to still love you. That is what John Lewis said. Why? Because love was one of his core values. He also said, have a passion for what you do, but also have a strategy for doing it. Congressman Lewis was passionate about securing voting rights. He also had a strategy. What became known as Bloody Sunday was carefully planned. He knew the risk of being jailed, in fact, he had a book and his toothbrush with him in his backpack that day. He was prepared to go to jail. He knew that the media attention on the march across that bridge would shine a light on the struggle of Black people in the South who were not permitted to vote. That was his strategy, and the strategy worked. President Johnson made an impassioned plea to the nation the next week. He said, at times, history and fate meet at a single time in a single place to shape a turning point in man's unending search for freedom. So it was at Lexington and Concord. So it was a century ago at Appomattox. So it was last week in Selma, Alabama. And as a result, the Voting Rights Act was passed. Throughout his life of activism, Congressman Lewis was beaten, bloodied, spat upon, insulted, condemned, and often misunderstood. However, he always kept his eye on the prize and he never gave in to despair, not on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, not in the more than 40 jail cells where he was held, not on the back roads and byways he traveled to register people to vote. 
not in the halls of Congress. He never gave up on the dream. Another lesson I learned from him, which I know he would want me to share, is never, ever give up. In the last weeks of his life, the day before his final hospitalization, he stood on Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington, D.C., and without saying anything, he said it all. What a powerful and everlasting message. He was determined to send a message to young people, and he was intentional about how he was going to do it. Nothing was more important to John Lewis than inspiring others, particularly young people, to stand up, speak out, and never give up. I encourage you to do two things, be inspired and be inspiring. Be inspired by those with shared goals and values, as John Lewis was inspired by Martin Luther King Jr., who encouraged him to stay hopeful and optimistic, to never give in to the forces of bitterness and hate. Be inspired as John Lewis was by Jim Lawson, under whom he studied the philosophy and discipline of nonviolence and learned the way of peace and love as a way of living, not just as a technique. Inspire others as Congressman Lewis did when he went to Black Lives Matter Plaza, using his body to encourage good trouble. Reminding me of an old African proverb of which he was particularly fond. When you pray, move your feet. John used to say, use your body to make a difference. March, stand up, sit down, get in the way. He left us another message, taught us another lesson, in a letter he asked to be published following his death. In it, he said, I have done all I can to demonstrate that the way of peace the way of love and nonviolence is the more excellent way. Now it is your turn to let freedom ring. When historians pick up their pens to write the story of the 21st century, let them say that it was your generation who laid down the heavy burdens of hate at last, and that peace finally triumphed over violence, aggression, and war. So I say to you, John Lewis said, walk with the wind and let the spirit of peace and the power of everlasting love be your guide. You know, Congressman Lewis never regretted the sacrifices he made to advance the human condition. He would say to others, you should never ever stop working on behalf of this great country. Don't stop believing in America, ever. Know that you can make a difference. You can make America, indeed the world, better. All you have to do is get into a little good trouble, necessary trouble. Congratulations, Tulane. With your John Lewis Public Administration Program, you are getting into a little good trouble, necessary trouble, and preparing a host of very talented young people to do the same. Oh, how happy and excited John Lewis would be. Linda so wanted to be here with us today, uh, but could not make it due to another uh, commitment. And she found it really important to be able to deliver remarks directly from his family, from the foundation um, in support of our work. So if uh, there are any family members out there listening from uh, Congressman Lewis's family, any colleagues from the foundation, we send our thanks to you um, all the way from New Orleans. So thank you. And now we want to welcome our special guest today, Attorney General Eric Holder, who will be speaking with Dr. Lee Francis. Appointed by President Obama in 2009, Eric Holder was the first African-American Attorney General in our nation's history. 
three years later, you might remember this, Attorney General Holder visited Tulane Law School to a standing room only crowd as our Dreyfus lecturer on civil liberties and human rights. A poster of that visit by someone that I greatly admire, who was a public servant long before he had made history, is still in my office today. Throughout his time leading the Justice Department, Attorney General Holder made it clear that one of his top priorities would be protecting every American's right to vote. Today, inspired by Congressman Lewis and many others, he continues that work as chairman of the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, the organization he founded after leaving office. We are so honored to welcome you to Tulane. Again, Attorney General Holder. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. <laughs> Is this working? Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I've prepared a few questions okay. and um, easy ones. Easy questions. Right. I'm not gonna, you know, incriminate anyone, but um I'll try not to. All right. But I we we really are excited to hear your insight. So to get us started. Uh, talk to us about your relationship with Congressman Lewis. Uh, how did he influence your perspective and your work? That's an interesting question. Um, it's a multidimensional question. Um, he was a person um, who I admired for the way in which he conducted himself as a man, or particularly as, as a black man. Um, I respected his life in public service as a, as a congressman. And um, he was a dear friend. Um, he was there during some critical points in the life of my family. Uh, when my late sister-in-law died, Vivian Malone, who was the first African-American uh, to attend the University of Alabama, you know, George Wallace School, standing in the schoolhouse door. When she died, um, he spoke at her um, funeral. He spoke at my daughter's uh, graduation. Um, he came to the Justice Department early on when I was um, at AG. Uh, to speak. It was an interesting time. He came with a prepared speech. And um, those you know, first couple of paragraphs sound, you know, very good. And then he just threw the speech away. <laughs> and then he just went John Lewis on it and um, gave, I think, among the most moving remarks that have ever been uttered in the Great Hall of the United States Department of Justice. Um, so he meant everything to me. Uh, you know, public figures. <sighs> all have faults, I mean, they're human beings. And yet I never found a fault with John Lewis, you know? Um, never a hint of scandal, um, never a compromise uh, that was unprincipled, um, a person who was dedicated to his life's work. Um, and really, as, as, as has been indicated, really took it upon himself. He thought it was important that um, he prepare the next generation and the generation after that to continue the work that he and so many others did in the, uh, in the civil rights movement. He was, uh, he was rightly called you know, the conscience of, of the Congress. And in a lot of ways, I think he was the conscience of, uh, you know, of the nation. Thank you, thank you. Now, in his last essay, uh, Lewis presented a, a call to us to make some, some key um, commitments. Uh, two of those were voting and participation in the democratic process and to study and learn the lessons of history. These are also the focal points in your book, The Unfinished March, or Our Unfinished March, excuse me. Now, why are these two actions so critical to the future of our nation and to our local communities? Yeah, I, I think the study of history is extremely important because without a sense of our, our history, and how we got to where we are and the progress that we have made. If you view things in a vacuum, you know, you just look at America in, in 2022, you think, oh God, how are we ever gonna get out of this? I mean, how are we ever gonna get to the nation that is not as polarized, not as divided, um, get back on track? And you think, well, it just seems like it's impossible to do. But, but a knowledge of history will tell you that generations of Americans before faced similar crises 
uh, maybe even more substantial crises and found their way to um, protecting democracy, um, fostering American ideals. And so the study of history, I think, is extremely important. Voting is the way in which we, all of us, um, have the ability to influence the direction of the nation, the policies that are going to be put in place. You know, I've had a lot of titles in my life. I've been a judge, I've been a U.S. attorney, um, deputy attorney general, um, you know, attorney general of the United States. But I, I hold now, I think, the most important title I'll ever will hold. That's citizen of the United States. And as a citizen, which we all are, um, our, our primary responsibility is, again, to try to influence the direction of the nation. And we do that most directly by casting a vote. Um, people, we owe a debt. We owe a debt to people like John Lewis and others who are, whose names have been forgotten to us in history. Um, people who sacrificed, uh, committed themselves, people who died so that this generation of Americans would have the ability to do things that they did not, chief among them being the right to vote. I mean, people tend to forget in the civil rights movement, we think of it as marches, demonstrations, um, the march on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, but without understanding what the, under, what the glue was, what was the thing that motivated all of this? Chief among the things that what they wanted to accomplish in the civil rights movement was to make sure that every American had the right to vote. The passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, mm -hmm. in which we had just today an important Supreme Court argument, um, transformed the nation. I mean, transformed the South in particular. You see black participate or the number of black public officials in the South skyrocket after um, the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. You see people who had to go through literacy tests, you know, poll taxes, you know, counting jelly beans in a jar, people having the ability to vote for uh, you know, the very first time. Um, so that knowledge of history, that commitment to civic participation and especially voting, I, I think are two of the things that really animated um, John Lewis's life and I hope will remain with us um, as we look finally back on a life well led. So it's that, that hope, that responsibility and, and taking that action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you also talk about when you joined Congressman Lewis in commemorating Bloody Sunday and the Selma to Montgomery marches. Um, what was the significance of this moment for you in light of your role as, as then U.S. Attorney General, Shelby, et cetera? And, and what can our students learn from that moment? Yeah, it was a pretty intimidating moment. I mean, I was at Brown Chapel um, in Selma. I had to give a speech uh, in front of John Lewis. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's kind of like Start there. <laughs> okay, you know, you better bring it today. <laughs> um, and as I remember, he spoke as well. Fortunately, after me, uh, he'd never want to follow John Lewis. So he'd throw the remarks away and then just go go from there. Um, and I thought what was important about that day, and we were—I think the remarks we made were, were kind of similar, in the sense that we were marking the progress that um, we had made as a nation, that we had made a, as a people, and speaking about, I mean, I'm saying, you know, well, you know, the first African-American attorney general here, um, but we also said, we're not yet at the place where we need to be, you know? That America, in fact, has changed. America is better, but America is not yet at the place where um, it needs to be. And there was that call, again, by him for that, um, that continuation, that recommitment, um, that ability to see you know, where we are and still to imagine where we needed um, to go. I, I think in a lot of ways, that's what is so tremendous about John Lewis. I mean, he imagined um, an America that in his early years, he had never seen, you know, and tried to put in place an America that he had never actually seen. He had to imagine an America that, that could be. Uh, he talks about, you know, how he wrote a letter to Dr. King um, and said, you know, uh, John Lewis, come, you're, I'm a great admirer of yours, I want to come meet you. Dr. King writes back, he meets him. And that starts him on, you know, on that path. And, um, you know, it, it, when, when you think about Dr. King, John Lewis, and all the other folks deciding to destroy a system of American apartheid, 
I mean, think about that, you know, an American apartheid, Plessy versus Ferguson's 1890-something or other. This is something that, you know, has existed for almost 100 years mm -hmm. on top of the slavery experience. And he is saying that what we're going to do is build a better America. I don't know what it looks like in the sense that I can imagine what it looks like, but I've never seen it. And yet that's what uh, he committed himself to do. And in doing so, as I said, transformed uh, the nation. And, you know, the civil rights movement certainly would made it better for uh, people like me, African-Americans, but it also made the nation better. You know, America was better as a result of the civil rights movement. And the civil rights movement also inspired other groups of people to decide that they wanted to be treated in an equitable way as well. I think you can trace um, the rise in consciousness of women to the civil rights movement, certainly the LGBTQ community to the rise, their, their, their desire for equality to the, the civil rights movement, the tactics of the civil rights movement, um, that quest for um, e equality. Um, he was uh, you know, a seminal figure in the life of this nation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad that you um, acknowledge and, and recognize the, the arc of time. Um, in our classes, I often get, and I'm looking at one of our students that's asked me this question, um, do we think we'll ever get there? Um, do we think that the change will ever be made? Um, but recognizing how long this journey has been, um, certainly your, your book title is appropriate in that regard. So thank you. Yeah, it, it's time for us to get to that place. You know, I'm at, you know, I'm the last quarter. Of, of my life. Um, I hope it's going to be a long last quarter. Um, but the reality is, I'm at the point now at my age where when people say we've made progress, it ain't enough. It's not enough. We have made progress. I will concede that. And that's a good thing. But when do we get to the point where we stop making progress and get to the point where we need to be? Uh, I'm actually optimistic that that will happen. Um, largely because of, and this is not to say anything negative about people my age, um, but largely because of the young people in um, this country who don't come to um, civic life, who don't carry the, the racial baggage that, you know, that my generation um, was forced to carry. Um, I think of my daughter, Maya, who used to, who was a student here. Um, I had to make a decision. Big decision, you know, whether or not we we're going to defend the Defense of Marriage Act, which essentially said, you know, that same-sex marriage was was inappropriate, was wrong. Um, Justice Department people gather together, decisions, solicitor generals on one side, office of legal counsels on another side, criminal, everybody's in different places. So it comes down to what's the attorney general going to decide. And so I make the decision we're not going to defend the Defense of Marriage Act. I come back, tell my daughter, you know, hey, I did something really big today, Maya. You know, we're not going to defend the Defense of Marriage Act. Uh, I'm going to stand for same-sex marriage, you know, expecting her to say, wow, well, good job, Dad. And she went, well, okay, so why would you decide any other? <laughs> and so that was deflating <laughs> on the one hand, but after some reflection, um, <laughs> I thought that was actually a pretty good thing, you know, that she simply thought, well, of course, why would you think about it in any other way. And so I think that's why I'm optimistic about where we will ultimately mm. get. And I hope in relatively short order, it would be not a good thing for um, another 100 years, another 50 years to go on before we get to, um, to that place. Now, you know, progress is not something that goes, you know, in a straight line. There are two steps forward and one mm -hmm. step back, three steps forward, one step back. And um, we should not expect that in this March, this unfinished March, we're going to simply get there, you know, next couple of years. But it, it's time to start thinking about how we get to an end game. And so we can heal this nation, um, treat everybody in an equitable way, um, and, and focus on, you know, we spend, I think, all the time, all the time that we as a nation and as individuals devote to issues of race, um, you know, gender equality, um, sexual orientation. Think of all these things, all the time we spend on that, where we could be, um, we could be using our, our great minds and, and the resources of this nation uh, to do a variety, of, uh, a variety of other things. So I'm hoping that, as I said, we'll get there um, you know, relatively soon. Not, not another 100 years, not another 70 years, um, you know, not a lifetime of 
you know, the next John Lewis book, something, you know, something changed. And as I said, I'm optimistic because of uh, the young people, especially if the young people come to a, you know, a great school like, uh, like this one. Absolutely, thank you. Now, our program takes an all hands on deck approach to teaching civic leadership. Uh, we emphasize the importance of not only government, but also nonprofits, philanthropy, and private business. So how can all of these sectors, all of these domains work together effectively, specific in the realms of civic engagement, policy, and partnership with government? Yeah, I think it is an all hands on deck approach. Um, we should not think that it is simply the role of government to uh, put in place measures, laws, policies that are gonna move the nation along. Um, there are powerful interests in the private sector, philanthropic sector, um, the educational sector. Uh, all of us, all of these institutions, I think have to be part of this fight for, uh, this fight for change. I think it's interesting that the, uh, the business round table, um, I guess about 18 months ago, two years or so ago, the, the pandemic skews my thinking, but it's probably, probably four years ago, but I don't know. Um, but the business roundtable said, you know, this notion that the primary responsibility of um, companies is to increase shareholder value, you know, comes out of the University of Chicago, you know, School of Economics. Um, they said, no, actually, the primary responsibility is for corporations to be good citizens, which means you should be thinking about issues of debt diversity, equity, inclusion. You should be thinking about the way in which you operate in the communities in which you are, are located, a whole range you know, of other issues. And so the business roundtable, and these are you know, businessmen making you know, lots of money for lots of people, said this is something that we should be focused on. And my hope would be that um, in this all hands on deck approach, that other institutions, other sectors of our society will also focus that way on, um, focus on those goals and focus on the notion that they have to be engaged, they have to be involved. I mean, you know, what you are, are doing here with this, um, this entity to be named for, you know, for John Lewis is an example of the kind of thing that I think that we need to be doing. Um, there should be these kinds of components within all of our great educational institutions. But I also think that just as part of um, the normal way in which we teach our young people, especially, you know, college age students, um, that they need to be engaged citizens. They need to be engaged in the civic life of this nation because the reality is, the reality is that unless the best and the brightest um, who go to this school, and I spoke at Xavier earlier today, who go to that school, unless the best and the brightest from these kinds of institutions occupy these positions, they will be filled by other people who are less committed, less idealistic and less concerned about notions of equality and um, inclusion. So it's, you know, there's a vacuum that will either be, it will be created by, you know, people who uh, might not think that we still have a ways to go, or they'll be filled by people like folks you will be training and the people who are trained here at Tulane uh, who are committed to that, uh, that better America. Thank you. Now, um, can you share, and you've touched on this a bit, but but sharing more in depth, uh, what do you think will be the most challenging issues facing public administrators in the next decade? And what will be the most important skills that they need to overcome? Public administration. Now, how do we define public administration? You mean so those who are working across all of those sectors that, okay. we, that we described. Yeah, um, I, I think it's going to be dealing with this changing America that we see, you know? Um, the demographics of this nation are changing by, it used to be 2050, now I understand it's 2043. Um, this nation will have more people of color than it will have white folks. Um, and that can be something that can be in the United States, a source of great strength given the diversity of the world, um, or it can be something that really divides the country. And so in each of those sectors, I think dealing with those demographic changes is going to be something that um, they're going to have to confront. This notion of, you know, again, diversity, equity, and inclusion, that's going to be something I, I think that will be, you know, pretty close to the top of the, the things that uh, public administrators are going to have to um, consider. And rightly so. Um, you know, as I said, these changing demographics, given the competitive world that we have, you know, it's 
United States, China, our European allies, Africa will rise. Um, we have a strength that other more homogenous nations don't have in our diversity. We can deploy, um, you know, I was a member of a, a law firm in Washington, D.C., and I've done matters in Africa where I was received, I think, yeah, right, because I was a Barack Obama's attorney general. That helps. That helps. <laughs> it's in the uh, door. <laughs> I don't, that helps a lot. Um, but also because they see this black man coming from the United States qualified to help them with issues that they might have in other parts of the world. Only the United States has the ability to kind of project that, you know, Asian folks, um, African-American folks, um, you know, Muslim Americans. Uh, oh, oh, we have the capacity, given the diversity that is, I think, our gift. We have that ability to project um, American power. People always say that the 20th century was um, an American century. Well, the 21st century can be an American century as well if we take advantage of the strengths um, you know, that we have and not allow that, um, that, that coming diversity, demographic changes to be um, a divisive thing. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, one aspect of our program's mission calls out intention towards cultivating ethical leadership. How important is this value for advancing sustainable solutions to our national and local challenges? I think that's the core. You know, you can't, you can't preach, you can't teach, you can't move people unless you come from an ethical place. You know, um, then, then you're because if you don't, you're seen as hypocritical. You know, you're trying to move people, you're trying to get people to act in a certain way. But if you've got skeletons in your closet, or if you're conducting yourself in a way that's inconsistent with the way in which you're saying other people should conduct themselves, um, your message is you know, becomes close to meaningless. Your ability to, to, to move, you know, the nation, to move a community, to move an institution, um, you know, really gets um, gets seriously uh, is, well is, is seriously deteriorated, um, and so you know. And that, that's one of the keys for John Lewis. Um, as I said earlier, you know, a, a public official who was, you know, I'm sure always examined, you know, they're always looking at public officials trying to figure out, you know, what their, mm -hmm. their weak spots were, what their, mm -hmm. what their, what their weaknesses were. Mm -hmm. um, never found them with him. And therefore, his was a singular voice, you know. Um, and he moved people. You know, he moved people in Congress. He moved people in the nation. Um, you know, what the president was saying about the way he was received here when he received that, that honorary degree. That's a function of, um, you know, who he was, who he was, and how he was perceived as a very, you know, ethical, ethical person. Now, um, we've I've certainly enjoyed talking to you and, and all that you've shared. And um, as we close out and wrap up today. Uh, what final thoughts would you like to share with Tulane, the Lewis Public Administration Program, and the greater New Orleans community? Do you have a call to action for us? Sure. I mean, I think that, um, <laughs> buy you know, book, yeah. Yeah, 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 buy the book. Um, uh, <laughs> um, and then read the book. Um, yes. The, um, you know, what I would say, uh, I was at uh, Tim Francis' house um, last night. We had a great uh, event there. Tim is such a low energy person. Uh, <laughs> for those of you who know him, you know, he like, he, like he's had about 15 cups of coffee, you know? Um, and I think I would end, end here kind of the way I, I ended there. You know, you know, Dr. King said that the arc of the moral universe is long and it bends towards justice, you know? But here's the deal. It doesn't bend on its own. It only bends when people like us, like all of you, put their hands on that arc and pull it towards justice, as John, as John Lewis did. And so I think the question that we have to ask ourselves as a society generally, but more specifically as individuals, what is it that we are doing? What is it that you are doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? To put your hand on that arc, pull it towards justice. Um, doesn't mean that you have to be a great leader like John Lewis or a politician. There are a whole range of ways in which you can pull that arc towards justice. Working in youth programs for kids who um, don't have the attention that every American kid deserves. 
um, helping students here who are perhaps struggling with their studies. You know, if you're a graduate student and help an undergraduate or a graduate student helping a graduate student, you know, whatever. Um, you know, faculty members taking that extra time uh, to make sure that all the students in front of you are actually kind of getting it and, and, that, they, and that they're heard. Um, there are a whole range of ways in which we can pull that arc um, toward justice, but each of us has to be doing something. We've got to be doing something. It's not enough to look at MSNBC or CNN or, or Fox and you know, yell at the television set and, and throw stuff. I mean, that, you know, that's not enough. I mean, oh yeah, you should be aware of what's going on in the world. The question is, what are you doing? What is it that you are actually doing? One of the things I do, uh, Sunday night's pretty calm in my house generally, uh, more calm now that I'm almost an empty nester. Um, <laughs> and I ask myself, well, seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night, I look back at the week that I just had and I say, well, what have I done? What have I done in the last week? And what am I going to do in the week to come? And I think if you go about that kind of self examination, you know, ask you, week before, the week to come, um, and try to achieve something in each of those spheres before and after, you know, week before, week to come. Um, and if we all do that, we can bring this nation to the place where it, uh, it should be. As I said, I'm, I'm optimistic about it. I really think, I really, really think that, um, you know, that we can, we can do this. But again, positive change is not promised. Civil rights movement didn't happen because it was promised. Women didn't get the right to vote because it was promised. People sacrificed, people committed themselves, people, them ded people dedicated themselves um, to the cause. And that's what all of us um, have to do. If we do that, we'll get to that better place and we won't be satisfied with progress. We'll get to the, uh, we'll get to the final goal. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, okay. I appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. <laughs>